It's a discovery that could shake up crucial markets for both commodities and technology. Turkey says it has discovered the world's second largest rare earth element reserve, estimated to contain 694 million tons of rare earth minerals. The deposit is the world's second largest behind China. These elements run our everyday lives, being found in products from batteries and smartphones to fighter jets and satellites. Located in the Belikova district of Eskishehir in central Anatolia, the discovery was announced last month by Turkey's Minister of Energy and Natural Resources, Fatih Dönmez. The minerals are reportedly close to the surface, making their extraction more cost-effective. Although not actually rare, the 17 metallic elements are often extremely expensive to extract and process and can vary in quality. The reserve in Eskishir contains 10 of those rare minerals, which is expected to make Turkey a major player in both exports and manufacturing. For decades, China dominated the market for rare earth minerals, having the world's largest reserve and refining capabilities. And now to discuss the significance of Turkey's rare earth mineral discovery. Joining me from Newark, Delaware, is Julie Klinger. She is an assistant professor at the University of Delaware and from Ankara, Abdülkadir Balıkçı. He is the chairman of the Turkish Energy, Nuclear and Mineral Research Agency. A warm welcome to you both and thanks for joining me on Straight Talk. So Abdülkadir, Turkey says it has discovered the world's second largest deposits of rare earth minerals. How significant is this discovery and what do we know about it so far? Okay. In Turkey, rare earth reserves were determined in Eskişe Beylikova, Malatya, Koluncak, Sivas and Burdu with the researches conducted by the General Directorate of Mineral Research and Exploration. Actually, it has been known that for many years there are uh, mine uh, rare earth mineral deposits there, but with the rec recent development and uh, recent discovery, uh, the reserve as such as as much as 695 million tons, uh, second to the China, which currently has the largest rare earth element deposits of uh, 800 million tons. Yes. Uh, in addition to this, uh, these uh, potentials, also we have other fields, such as uh, in Sparta, Sofular, and Kaisid in Jesu regions. Mm -hmm. So, Julie, Julie, what's your take on that? I mean, is this a significant discovery? And if the deposits are of high quality, what could that mean for Turkey um, over the long term? I mean, will it be a game changer? Well, I'm particularly encouraged to see that there are immediate plans to develop this as an industrial asset for Turkey specifically, that the plan is to use a lot of the resources that are mined uh, in industrial applications domestically first mm -hmm. and to export the surplus. And so according to that model, uh, this is potentially a, a revolutionary find because it diversifies the global supply chain, not just of rare earth mining, but also value added processing and technological applications as well. Hmm. So, uh, Abdul Kadir, we know that rare earth minerals are more abundant uh, than their name suggests, but extracting, processing, and refining the metals requires a range of technical know-how, as well as it leaves a severe environmental impact. So where does Turkey stand? Does it have the nece necessary infrastructure to fully exploit those uh, metals? Yeah, uh, actually, as you said, uh, the taking the rare earth elements from the earth's crust and also the whole thing, the, uh, producing the uh, metals from that, uh, you know, ores, uh, it has uh, very bad effects on the uh, environment. Mm -hmm. So in our institute, uh, uh, NATEM, uh, which is Rare Earth Research uh, Institute in Tenma, uh, we are trying to develop a technology to uh, produce these uh, metals from uh, rare earth uh, minerals, uh, which has uh, less uh, effects on environment. So in our institute, we are trying to develop this kind of new technologies uh, to uh, get the, uh, as much as uh, uh, benefit from these uh, elements. Yes. So, uh, Julie, Without, uh, yes. so, Julie, once proven, uh, let's say, to be useful, which countries do you think would be more interested in facilitating the exploration and extraction of those minerals? 
Well, as you say, the name uh, rare earth is a little bit of a misnomer. So rare earths are actually quite abundant uh, throughout the Earth's crust, which means that most countries have a reserve that is potentially mineable. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that every country has a reserve that approaches uh, the one that uh, has been discovered in Turkey. But what that does mean, though, is that uh, we can expect to see real interest uh, in various technology sectors. So whether that is uh, energy generation, renewable, fossil fuel, nuclear, or otherwise, or whether it's for advanced uh, technological or scientific applications. Mm. So, uh, Abdukada, do you think this could offer an alternative to Chinese dominance in the global markets and uh, make Turkey an important player in rare earth supply chain, or this is a far-fetched goal for the time being? No, no, it, actually, it's a good alternative to China uh, because uh, we have the second biggest uh, deposit in, in the world. Uh, the only thing we need some little bit of time uh, to develop this technology and uh, the, uh, producing the uh, metals from that uh, uh, deposits. So, Julie, uh, Russia's attack on Ukraine has spurred the European Union to end its reliance on um, Russian oil and gas. But when it comes to rare earth uh, minerals, it heavily relies on China. So could Turkey become a major rare earth exporter, if all these are proven, of course, helping Europe lessen its dependence on China? I think that's a lot of the excitement around this discovery is that it does provide an alternative source for uh, rare earths outside of China. And of course, the crucial piece of the puzzle there is uh, also you know, the stated plans to develop uh, industrial infrastructure within Turkey to do the value added processing, because that is also another part of the supply chain that is currently concentrated in China. And so uh, many countries, uh, within the EU. Um, also, I'm speaking from the United States and a number of a number of other countries have really been struggling over the past decade mm -hmm. to not mm -hmm. just open new mines, but also develop the requisite industrial infrastructure to bring rare earth processing closer to home. And so I think there's a lot of excitement around this precisely because of the urgency that has been amplified by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So, um, Gabriel Kadir, the U.S., we know that, has plans to uh, rival China and end the cornering of the market in rare uh, earth minerals. How is that going to play out, do you think? I mean, can the U.S. compete with China? Yeah, it's a very difficult situation right now uh, because uh, for the uh, developing new materials or uh, adding new uh, specifications on the materials, you need to have this kind of rare earth elements. So uh, the world is heavily dependent on the Chinese production on these elements. Uh, it happened before because a uh, couple of years ago, mm -hmm. uh, for the, using for the uh, renewable energy, such as uh, wind turbines, we need to have uh, permanent magnets, uh, heavy uh, flux, uh, heavy flux uh, permanent magnets. So, so to produce this kind of uh, permanent magnets, uh, we need to have uh, rare earth elements such as neodymium. Uh, also, more than 90% of the neodymium comes from the, uh, from China. Uh, that time, China uh, put some quotas on these ma materials and uh, the production uh, dropped heavily yes. from the other side of the world. Yes. So, Julie, if Western uh, nations restart the production today, which they are talking about, how long do you think it would take for uh, Europe and the United States to uh, catch China's level of rare earth uh, mineral production? Mm, that's a very interesting question. I think that the answer depends entirely on the political will and public investment in rebuilding the supply chain in different parts of the world outside of China. Um, I say that because it took 
a good 30 years for China to build its robust supply chain domestically. Yeah. And um, I, the, the point that I do want to emphasize, though, is that although uh, much of the su critical upstream parts of the supply chain are located within China, uh, that is a space that is populated by uh, international firms and actors as well. Mm -hmm. And so although there is a sort of uh, you know country to country geopolitical competition, um, in practice, from an industry and business standpoint, the supply chains are quite well integrated integrated through and across China with Chinese and international actors uh, playing in that space. And that's a level of, of nuance that I think is important to um, uh, to ground these geopolitically charged discussions around the supply chain, because it helps bring our attention back to the fact that uh, we all have a shared interest, including China, I include China in that as well, in diversifying and cleaning up the global rare earth supply chain. Mm -hmm. Within that, a little bit of competition is healthy, right? And so uh, people within the US and Australia, Canada, and many other parts of the world are motivated uh, you know, through this uh, business competition uh, in order to uh, get their rare earth reserves and supply chains up and running. And I think a little bit of friendly competition can only make things better. So, uh, but having uh, talked about the competition, Abdul Qadir, uh, could latest tensions between China and the U.S. over Taiwan, let's say, disrupt the global supply chain uh, for rare earth minerals? And is China likely to use these materials as a, a weapon for a political le leverage? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because rare earth elements are mostly used in uh, digital products such as, you know, mobile phones, hard disk components, and microchip uh, development uh, processes. So China most probably use this power to uh, struggle to uh, struggle with the Western uh, countries. So uh, if it did, uh, Julie, let's say, if it did use these as a political weapon, what kind of economic ramifications would this have on especially European and Western economies, which are kind of grappling with energy crunches nowadays? Uh, I think that's a really big if, first off, because uh, the supply chain does not flow in one direction from China. Uh, the supply chain, the global supply chain for rare earths uh, loops through China in multiple steps in all of this. And so um, if China were to disrupt uh, the export of a certain level of processed rare earth elements, uh, that would actually uh, hurt its imports for technological assembly and that sort of thing in, in other parts of the supply chain. So that is a very big if. Um, I want to qualify that first. And if, of course, a disruption of, light, of, uh, of that sort were likely to occur, uh, we could expect to see uh, ramifications uh, market-wide, you know, as uh, with manifest in the form of price increases and things like that. All right, Julie and Abdul Qadir, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it here. Thank you very much for joining me on Straight Talk.